Romans 14 is, just quick review, is about what? Anyone remember from last week? Big picture. Okay, I'll give you a hint. This is what it's about. Cat fights, okay. Disputes, right? Disputes amongst the church, and not disputes over um, first order matters, uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, the inerrancy and sufficiency of the scripture, um, not disputes over those sort of things, but what sort of disputes, according to the first verse? Questionable things. Uh, there's different words that's translated in different translations. Questionable things. Uh, the, the New King James says doubtful disputes. Um, Disputable matters, you could say. Some like to use the term gray matters, uh, those sorts of things. The, the problem with the term gray issues, as opposed to black and white kind of thing, the problem with that is that that sounds very subjective. And some, something that is often a black or white issue in the scripture, like the Trinity, some will say, oh, that's, that's just a gray matter. That's just an issue that we can't. No, there are. Th- so we're talking about not those things that are plain and clear in scripture. And it seems like for Romans 14, the primary things he's going to be talking about are applications of scriptural principles. So applications of it. Um, Interpretations of difficult passages, applications of of scripture, uh, practical implications of what a certain text means. So for for example, we're not talking about disputing whether or not... um, uh, lust is wrong, whether we should lust or not, but it might be a dispute, for example, as to what someone can watch, whether that would produce lust or not. So application of the command is the idea here. Okay, are we on the same page what we're talking about? He's going to give two examples in the text itself. Those are but examples. They're not meant to be the only things we apply the principles here. They're meant to be in his day, things that were hot issues in disputable matters. Uh, one of the aspects when we're looking through this, and we looked be- last week and we really got through here, um, is the, the action verb that we're looking at is, is what? Receive, right? So he, before he talks about the disputable matters, he tells us already what we are to do when we encounter a brother or a sister with whom there is a dispute over opinionated things and applications of it. What's the default response that we need to set ourselves up to? To receive them. Can you see how obeying this command with your attitude is actually going to affect even how you dispute the matter. If you're disputing the matter with an intent to receive them, rather than an intent to best them, to beat them, to show them why they're so wrong about this, and to come out on top as the victor, that's the opposite attitude we're, we're to have. It also produces something else. If my goal is to receive a brother with whom I disagree on one of these disputable matters, if my goal is to receive them, what specific action am I going to do regarding their opinion? I'm going to listen. How can I receive him if I really don't understand, truly know where he stands on the issue? Is that a problem in our world at large and in Christianity as well? Listening. How do you know when you're not listening to someone in a dispute? You ever thought of that question? How do I know if I'm not? Right. When you're already formulating what you're going to reply to before they've even finish telling you their opinion. This leads to not only greater dispute, not receiving one another, but it actually leads to a whole lot of misunderstanding. 
I can't think of a more apt place where we see this in action as in politics. And I don't just mean politicians, I mean people who discuss politics, <laughs> right? Um, th 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 that's just one area. I thought it was interesting. I went to a debate not very long ago, um, atheism versus Christianity, or atheism versus the triune God. It was the subject of the debate. And it was really interesting to me that um, I was sitting a couple seats around. A, a brother of ours had invited a friend who's an atheist to the debate. And I sat there and I thought, and if you were to watch the debate, I'm sure you would agree with me because most. 90% of those who watched the debate thought this, that the atheists did a terrible job debating. I mean, that there have been better debates by atheists. This guy was not good. Um, and I thought, surely, if you're an atheist here, and then you're not like the spouse of the debater, like, surely, you came away and you said, oh, not our best showing. And I've talked to our brother, and he's talked to his friend, and his friend said, no, I think I still side with the atheist view. And I was like, you know what's funny about that debate? It was probably split around 70-30, um, 70% at the debate were probably of Christian mindset worldview, and 30% were of a secular or atheist worldview. I think after that debate, just looking around, I think 70% were of a Christian worldview, and 30% were of an atheist worldview when it came out of it. It didn't seem to change, because people, they don't really listen. That's not our, we, we combat. We argue. We find, we're, we're listening for little key words someone might say that's going to spur some argument that we're going to win on. The first thing, if we are going to receive a brother, and we're not, that was a situation we're not even a brother is talking about, right? I'm talking about a brother situation here. The first thing we got to do is we've got to truly hear them. And I, I agree with what was said. When, if we're not formulating a response, that's a good step in the right direction. Here's another evidence that we're actually listening. Can you repeat their argument in such a way that they would agree with you. If you can't, you haven't really heard their argument yet. If you can't repeat it in such a way they would agree with you without arguing against it, just you can repeat it back to them. Um, that's, th now that takes a lot of work. You know what's a lot easier? Die heretic scum. That's a lot easier, right? It's a lot easier just to like, I got my points, I'm done, I'm sealed, whatever, just leave me alone, um, you're wrong, that's easier. It's, it's hard to receive somebody, because you got to listen, and you got you to think through what they're saying, and you've got to listen to their points of view. You don't have to agree. In fact, I think from this text, it becomes very clear with this idea of receiving, that Paul is not saying, disputable matters, just don't talk about those things. Just keep those things under wraps. Let's just, you know, we don't, it's like at the family Thanksgiving a lot of people stereotype, we don't talk about religion and politics, we just don't talk about those things. In the church, there are things that people say, we just don't talk about those things. I don't think Paul's saying that at all. He's describing a scenario where you're going to talk about those things, but you're doing it this way, and you're responding to it this way. That's the idea of this text, this chapter. It's not how to keep quiet about things so that nobody gets their feelings hurt. <laughs> It's how to receive a brother when you are in disagreement. And how would you receive him if you didn't even know you were in disagreement? So that's the application here. We talked about what it meant to receive and why, and the two words we mentioned last week that were super important were the idea of despising and judging. We're going to look more at those this week, at the concept of why he gives, assigns one to one side and one to the other side of the debate. But first, before that, I wanted to um, talk about how he characterizes the two proverbial brothers in the, in the situation. Okay, let's read this. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one, so we got one party, right? One believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetable. Vegetables. Now, this eating vegetables and eating all things, as I, I'm repeating what I said before, uh, but I'll repeat it in a question form. Is, is this text about whether you can eat vegetables or you can eat everything? 
No, yeah, it's not about that, right? He starts right off, and this is, this is great writing. I know it's Holy Spirit inspired, but I also want to give Paul the vessel God used credit. This is great writing. He jumps right into a hot argument right away at the very opening before he gives any principles about how to do it. And I can just picture reading this, and some reading this have already started to formulate the reasons why you can eat all things. And some have already started to formulate the reasons why you can only eat vegetables. And it's kind of almost exposing the mind of not receiving by throwing it out there the very first thing. So he's, <laughs> to use modern language, he's trolling them a little bit, right? Throwing it out there, get thinking about it. And then he's going to pull back from it and hit another topic altogether. But he talks about one believing, and we can assume in the text that the other one believes he eats only vegetables, can only eat vegetables. So we have the, um, the unrestricted, right? And the restricted, right? How does he characterize the restricted? Okay, he characterizes them as weak. Is this an insult? Well, it can't be, right? It can't be because he's actually going, he would be guilty of um, despising him, right? He's not trying to be hypocritical here. It, it can't be an insult. It must mean something else. Um, let's look at the second example. Verse five. One person esteems one day above another. Another person esteems every day alike. So another issue, right? So specifically what he's talking about in the context is he is talking about, um, I mean, we believe he's talking about Jewish uh, holidays. That was a big conflict in the early church, whether or not you should continue to celebrate Passover, whether you should continue to celebrate the feast of this or the feast of that after you have become a believer because Christ fulfills those things. So we're done with them. And you remember the Jewish side of it was, no, we need to keep, keep, we keep these things. And the Gentile side was, why are you making us keep things we never kept before? And there was a debate over that issue. It was a constant debate in the early church. Um, I believe that this issue is very similar because I don't think he's talking about the modern day sense of vegetarianism versus the um, modern sense versus what he was talking then. I think what he's referring to is the same kind of context of what specifically meat that is offered in the pagan world um, versus just, well, you know, that's all the meat you bought in the Roman world. Most of the meat in the markets, if you went to the markets, at one point were offered to um, idols before you could ever get them. That was a pagan practice. It wasn't that you could go to the store in that day in Rome and you could buy um, pagan offered meat and then non-pagan offered meat. All the meat was dedicated to the idols before it was sold to the public. So many Christians probably came up with this concept of, man, if I'm going to avoid all meat offered to idols, I'm going to have to avoid all meat. I believe this is what he's talking about because later in the text, if you look ahead, he addresses the issue of it being uh, offered to idols. So he's not talking, I think, about whether you'd be a vegetarian or whether you should be a meat eater. He's talking about specifically the meat is tainted in their mind religiously. Their meat is tainted with a spiritual component to it. That's why both of these have a spiritual component to it. Both of them are on, under the issue of, can I do this and how can I do it and give God glory when I know what it is? The one is saying, how can I keep this feast when I know Christ has fulfilled it? I feel like I'm going back. The other one's saying, how can you not keep this feast when you know that it's all about Christ? How can I eat this meat when I know that it's offered at first to pagan and then sold to the marketplace? How can I do that? And he says, how can you not eat it? God has given you meat. You see how these are both valid, in a sense, opinions. Okay, that's a possibility. We're going to go ahead, I think, and move to the next, throughout the text and see how he uses weak and strong here to see how that works out. But one of the interpretations of that is that weak is referring to um, new believer or mature believer is non-weak and the immature believer is weak. That's one interpretation. 
I'll just say I don't think that's the correct interpretation, though that is one that a lot of commentators most probably adhere to. Um, the re main reason why they suggest that's the reason is because Paul takes a side, and his side he takes is with the non-weak. And so they say, see, Paul was the mature one, and he's talking about these new believers. The reason I, one of the reasons I don't take that is that he's making a very strong case throughout this that it has nothing to do with your spiritual walk. It has nothing to do with your spiritual ability or your closeness to God or your, or those, or the, your, he says nothing about length of time of being a Christian or anything like that. So it seems to me to be adding something into the context that's not there. Let's just work through a little bit. His point is to let each one, right, the weak and we'll call it the strong, be fully convinced in his own mind. Argument against, once again, another argument against the weak refers to a spiritually mature person. Um, why would he suggest here that it's okay to be stay there? If you're convinced in your mind, you can stay there. That's fine. It seems like if he's talking about mature or immature, he would say move past that, right? So he doesn't though. And I know everywhere else Paul talks about that, he doesn't expect people to stay in that new believer type of state. So I don't think that's what he's saying, but let's move on a little bit further. We'll come back and read this. I just want to hit these areas here. So we've got the same thing in number six, he who observes the day. So that's the first example, the second example, right? The certain day, observe it to the Lord. Who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Okay, days, meets. Once again, bringing that up. Trying to find where I, where I put this in here. Uh, sorry. I lost my place here. Okay, here. Verse 10. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? So I wanted to bring this verse out because this draws us back to the beginning, right? Judging and showing contempt brings us back to despising and judging at the very beginning. So the one who eats, that's the unrestricted brother, unrestricted, right? He has a tendency to do what? To despise, or the other phrase it said is show contempt, right? Um, what, what would that look like, you think? Okay, maybe a non-association. That'd be the opposite of receiving as well, right? Okay, there, there is the idea of despising or showing contempt. There is the idea of an attitude, right? And there could be an attitude, a rude attitude, an unkindness in their approach. It seems to imply looking down on, right? Holding them as insufficient in some way. Um, that's, that's what it sounds despise is the idea of looking down. They are less than they, uh, it may be in a modern way. It, it could, it can sometimes be communicated this way. Um, well, I understand that you haven't read that part of the scripture yet, but once you do, you'll see as I see this idea like that I've determined it and it's, it's okay for you to be so foolish now. Um, that's not to say that we don't hold our opinions that are biblically informed with strength, but we don't do it with contempt, with looking down on the one who disagrees. That's the one attitude of the, tenden the tendency of the strong brother is to show contempt, right? The unrestricted. The tendency of the restricted is to do what? To judge, right? We looked at this a little bit last week. He says it again, uses the same word uh, back in verse 10. We looked at that. The tendency of the weak brother is to judge. What does that look like? Could be the same thing. Actually, Right, it actually sounds like the same, but a different way of doing it, right? Arrogance, both of them, I think, have an arrogance to them. Okay, yeah, it's like, 
elevating oneself, right? I, I have figured, both of them sound alike. It's the opposite of receiving one another. And it really is that idea of I'm determining that you're guilty. That's what a judge does, right? I'm determining you're guilty. Not just guilty of holding that opinion, but guilty against God's word. I'm determining that you're in sin for holding to this application of this, bibli- of this disputable matter. That's the tendency of the weak brother. Both are condemned, right? Both responses, I mean, are condemned by God here. Neither one is right. First reason we looked at last week as to why neither one is right is what? In other words, God doesn't do either. When God sees the brother who eats the meat, he does not judge him. And when God sees the brother who refuses the meat, he does not despise him, show contempt to him. So there really is this root issue, and it's essentially Paul saying, who do you think you are? Right? If God doesn't, why do you? That's the next verse. Who are you? to judge another's servant. Judge there is not just referring to the weak, I believe. I believe he's using the word judge to refer, as we said, to both opinions there, both perspectives. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Let's just piece this together. The another, who is the other? Well, it's one who's the master, right? The, the master's servant, he stands or falls. He will be made to stand, either one, right? Why? Because God is able to make him stand. So who is he saying? Who are you to judge? Let's trace it back. Who are you to judge God's servants? You see the point he's making? When we judge or despise, show contempt and arrogance and refuse to receive a brother on this disputable matter, we are putting ourselves in the place of God. And thus, even if they're wrong, our wrong has become worse. Our wrong has become stealing God's glory and position of authority. That's a far worse sin than if they're wrong on the vegetable issue, right? So it's this concept that we have to deal with that we often don't do so well with as Christians. And that is um, often a person is in error and we respond to their error with gross sin. That's a common thing. And when I say error, there is a difference between error and sin. Do you see that there's a difference between error and sin? Error simply means you're wrong about something. You're incorrect. But, but you, you maybe don't understand it rightly, or there's a mistake over here. Sin has the component of stepping over God's transgression, God's law. This person is in error because he has a mistaken understanding of meat and what God made it for. Paul's going to get to that in a minute. He says, we know that this is the right position, the correct understanding. But if, but, but if you have the correct position, right? You, you know you're, you're right. You know that it's, it's right and okay. You can be right positionally on a disputable matter, but oh, so wrong in your heart and be great, uh, have great sinfulness in how you approach it because you become idolatrous in order to correct this error of a brother. This is really amazing that this was written 2000 years ago, right? Because it sounds so appropriate today. The reality is that he's saying, don't make a greater error than vegetables. I mean, he's going to get to this later when he talks about, man, you really got the kingdom of God mixed up if you think it's all about vegetables and meat. 
This is far greater to judge God's servants. Now he says he, God, will be, he, the servant will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. What does he mean, do you think, stand there? Okay. God, he'll, God will strengthen him. Good. Any other thoughts? Redemption in what sense do you mean? Uh, well, we're talking about brothers here, already Christians. So I don't think it'd be referred to like a, a salvation in the future sense. Okay, established, sanctification, those are all good things. I think that's, those are all like appropriate, but I think he's ultimately speaking to the idea of what he's going to say over here um, when he talks about, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Here's the word stand again there. And I think what he is saying is that God establishes, God is the one who in this life will grow him, will strengthen him. And when you both stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he will stand with his head lifted up just as you will. Like it's, he's not going to stand there and God's going to say, um, you had it all right, except for that meat thing, right? It's not that at the day of the judgment seat of Christ, this is what the judgment is about. And so you're like jumping ahead in the judgment. You're taking this role on yourself. And then when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be really mistaken of what it's all about. Because God is able to make him stand now and in that day of judgment, that judgment seat of Christ. He will stand unashamed. He will stand just as you will stand. That's, I think, what he's referring to contextually as he moves toward that concept. Um, so after giving this second example we looked at before, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. What's the second principle that we are to consider related to this weak and strong thing? You can hear. I'll help you. Go ahead, somebody say it. <laughs> Okay, be convinced in your own mind. Be convinced in your own mind. It just gets lonely when I'm the only one talking up here. Um, I know, it's just uh, some more feedback. Um, so the first responsibility is receive because God has received. That's the first perspective when we're encountering this disputable matter. The second perspective is my goal is not to convince him. My goal is to be convinced in my own mind. Now, that's going to stop a lot of conversations before they begin. I mean, actually, that would ruin the internet. Because the whole way the internet works is you're supposed to say something before you know anything. Um, that's the way it works. Uh, but it, the idea that you're, that, can you not, like, just work it out yourself? Isn't it amazing? And I, I, I am ragging a little bit on the internet, especially social media stuff. Uh, but it isn't amazing that it's true that in our connected age that everyone knows a little bit about everything and they don't know a lot about one thing. So therefore, everyone has to have a hot take. Um, I'm on Twitter. Probably shouldn't be. I was recently thinking of deleting it. This is not helping my sanctification sometimes. Um, but I was on Twitter and there has been all sorts of things happening in the world out there that 100 years ago I would know nothing about um, because you don't see what's happening all over the world and you're in when you don't have all that stuff. All sorts of things happening out there. And the, I get the inevitable post after anything big happens, whether it's politically or spiritually or anything like that, the big post. If your pastor doesn't say something about such and such thing on Sunday, leave that church. That's a common Twitter phrase in case you didn't know. You know, some, th some civil rights things happen. If your pastor doesn't get up this Sunday and address that, you need to find a faithful church that will. And it's something, and I'm thinking, man, there's no time for preaching, just constantly addressing all the issues that are coming up. But here's the question I have. Am I qualified? Like, what do I really know about this? We've convinced ourselves we know far more than we do. Because I can go to Wikipedia and I can read something and now I'm an expert. And it's not just in the Christian world or the internet world. It's everywhere. It's one of the most annoying things to me that I finish eating a meal 
Um, I've learned, I made a mistake years ago, and I didn't think there was any harm in them giving my email out to all these company stores when you, when you uh, buy something or a restaurant, when you go eat there, you go you get your email. We just need this for our records, and you get it. And then before you get home, will you review your purchase? Um, give our opinion of the restaurant. I, don't, I feel pressure. I got res- to respond. I got to say something about everything. The idea here is slow down. That's a big proverb idea, right? Slow to speak. Slow down. Be convinced in your own mind. Now, it can help to talk to another person about those things because they can sometimes show areas where we think we're convinced and we're not as convinced as we thought we were. We shouldn't be as convinced as we thought we were. Um, We need to hear those kind of negative responses sometimes so that we can say, wow, I, I didn't think of that. The idea here is be fully convinced. So the first one is receive your brother and then seek to convince yourself before you even seek to convince him in your own mind. By the way, um, if being weak or strong was a negative thing either way, this statement would not be here, I don't believe. Do you understand what I mean? If being weak was a bad position to be in, then why would Paul said, go ahead, continue to be convinced in your weakness? Right? Why, why would he say that? It doesn't sound like weak and strong are necessarily negative in any way, or weak is negative and strong is necessarily positive um, as it relates to spiritual or, or matters. All right, let's move on a little bit. We're, I'm trying to build what we mean by weak and strong as we go. This is a key, this is a key phrase here, a key word in thinking about weak and strong. Mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he does not eat. He who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, we, we, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this, to this end... Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. All right, let's just, sometimes it's not good Bible study to just notice the frequency of words, but I think in this paragraph, it might actually help us a little bit. Let's just notice the frequency of some of these words here. You catching it here? Did you catch the frequency there? What is he saying? Okay, to the Lord, to the Lord, to the Lord. This goes back to the master idea, right? And so how how do we apply this in this situation here? How is he applying it? This is how he applies it. It's in the text. It's not about you. It's not about you. Who's it about? The Lord. The honor and the glory of the Lord. So this is a third principle. Here. Receive your brother. Be fully convinced in your own mind. And wherever you side on it, for the Lord, for the Lord's glory, for the Lord's sake, for his name. So this actually brings up a very, I think, uh, this he's, as he's moving the argument along, this brings up a very helpful um, question to ask about any of those disputable matters. It's this question. Can you do it to the Lord? Can you do it, can you not do it to the Lord? Can you eat it for the Lord's glory? Can you not eat it for the Lord's glory? You see how that's a helpful question? Um, In other words, it stops being about me doing it or not doing it because of him or because of myself. It now turns to, what does this honor my Lord? Does this honor my Lord? That's going to help us weed out all those things that we think are disputable matters that actually aren't. 
Because if you cannot do it to the Lord for the Lord's glory, it's not a disputable matter anymore. Right? If, it, if you say, well, I can do this, but, but it is not honoring to God. It's, it's, I, it's not the kind of thing that the Lord would, would approve of, but it's a gray matter. Is it really? Are things that do not honor God gray matters? They're not, right? And so this actually makes us begin to think the restricted brother is right. right? Restriction is better because due to the Lord, will the Lord be glorified, the Lord be glorified. But he turns it on its head because what is he saying in the text about is the restricted brother then right? I mean, because that's our, that's, by the way, that's our default. When we think of glorifying God or doing to the Lord, our natural inclination is to start restricting. I think because we have a very, um, as human beings and as Christians in general, I'm not saying everyone here, but we have a, a very, I, I think, short understanding of what it means to do something to the glory of God. We, we tend to restrict that to those things that overtly are gospel <laughs> or biblical. When I don't think that's Paul's perspective of God's glory. We can glor- it's not just we glorify God by doing Bible things. Paul would indicate many places, and this text is one of those, we can glorify God by what and how we eat. And he seems to be implying here that the restricted brother, by saying, oh, well, you're restricted, and it's only glorifying to God if it's restricted. Um, if we have these, as I don't like the term, but people said these high or strong standards. No, he's not saying that. He's saying that both people seem to be able to do it to the glory of God. He seems to be not, yes, I think he's adding some principles, but some might think he's actually muddying things up a little bit because it'd be nice if you just said what I'm supposed to do and not supposed to do, but he doesn't do that, right? He actually says, so you know what? Your brother who refuses to observe the holiday, he's refusing to observe for the glory of God, the Lord. And your brother who's celebrating the holiday, he's doing so for the glory of the Lord. Right. But he, I, yeah, I think he's making the should is implied, but I think he's putting it in. So he says he does it. You know, he's putting it in such a way that he's trying to say, because he's addressing their issue of judging each other. You know, you're assuming that he's not, but what if he is? And the one who eats the meat, he's eating it to the glory of God. And I can just hear the restricted brother saying, he can't eat meat offered to idols to the glory of God. And I can hear the brother who's eating the meat saying, I can eat meat offered idols of the glory of God. He gave me the meat. In other words, it doesn't mean the dispute is gone. It doesn't mean they agree now. Because never in the text of this chapter is he saying, here's where you'll come to the place where you'll finally be able to agree. It's not about agreeing on the topic. It's about receiving. It's about being convinced in your mind and glorifying God. Now. I'm going to throw this out there because we're out of time. Yes. I could throw it out there and not have to talk about it. Oh, no, it's next week it'll be passed. So we'll move on. Um, This I thought it was appropriate that this should come up at this time of the year because Halloween always brings this issue up, right? The issue of whether someone can do it to the glory of God or not to the glory of God. I have come to the position in my life where I am the weaker brother. I don't think I can celebrate Halloween at all to the glory of God. I know there are people who celebrate it in certain ways, and I believe they're trying to do so to the glory of God. Um, What do we do with that? I'm going to do everything I can to convince them they're wrong. But I'm going to do it without judging them or despising them, hopefully, by God's grace. I'm not saying I do this. I'm saying I want to do it without judging them or despising them and to seek to build and become convinced in my own mind and to glorify God, not only in what I do or don't do, but in even how I talk to a brother who does or doesn't. That, um, now, that's why I say we're out of time, so I can't talk about Halloween, uh, which is helpful for me right now. Um, that's an example. I'm just saying that's an example where there can be brothers who disagree on something. Now, the funny thing is, if you're a, if you're a brother in Christ, um, almost everybody I've talked to who has this different view who is a Christian there are certain things about Halloween that we both agree are not glorifying to God. 
And what's quick to brought up is there are certain things about Christmas that are not glorifying to God. There are certain things about Easter that are not glorifying. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> there are certain things in everything we do that are not glorifying to God because there is the world, we're, we're in, in the world. Um, I'm saying my, my weaker restricted position for myself is that I can't separate them. I, I'm having, I can't separate. I see them all blended together. And they're saying I can separate them. I can do it this way and not be doing it that way. And I feel like I'm glorifying God in it. And if that's the case, I'm saying, welcome. We receive one another because we have the same point, the same purpose, the same goal, the glory of God. I would simply warn them, be fully convinced in your own mind. Be convinced, do the work, and then be convinced. And of course, I said I was out of time, but of course, my opinion, because I believe I'm right, By the way, it's not wrong to say you believe you're right. You wouldn't have the opinion if you didn't think you were right, right? Um, My opinion is if you do pursue it out, I think you'll become unconvinced. But that's my own own thinking in the matter. Um, And for those of you that are really curious further, several years ago I wrote several articles about it, and you can look those up on the internet and leave it there. All right, let's pray. 